Hello and uh, welcome back to our survey of plasma physics course. Today we're going, to, of course, to pick up from where we left uh, with the last uh, lecture. And um, let me remind you actually of um, where we were. We were talking about um, the, uh, the by length. And um, let me remind you what the definition is. And uh, let's see, I can do that um, from uh, the Mathematica file we were looking at, or let me actually do it from my iPad. Okay, here we are, I connected my iPad, and so I can remind you of what this, the by length is. And the symbol we use <clears throat> to denote the by length is the Greek letter lambda, lowercase lambda with a subscript D. Here I'm writing uh, the square of it just for convenience and that is given by epsilon naught k t this could be the electron temperature the way we uh, proceeded but let me just indicate it with t and we can assume simply that the temperature of the electrons and of the i the temperatures of the electrons and the ions are the same and just list a, a single temperature. And remember that we have assumed that ions do not move to the ion in this expression. Now, um, we were looking at uh, some uh, numerical solution of um, the differential equation that allowed us to um, Uh, to come to <clears throat> this definition of this Debye length. And uh, if you remember, the last thing we looked at was um, the difference between um, the numerical solution and the approximate solution that we obtained using a Taylor expansion. <clears throat> And you see that the two are are pretty close, which is, you know, just great. That's what what uh, what we're hoping for. And here on the horizontal axis, I have the um, distance in terms of the by length. I'm starting uh, away from uh, the charge, and I'm going to guess that that the by length is a good. Um, um, estimate of what near and far means, much larger than the Debye length means we're far from the charge, less than the Debye length would mean we're too close for the charge. And that comes from the Taylor expansion. And our Taylor expansion means <clears throat> that <clears throat> is going to be valid when um, X over uh, lambda Debye is a small number. The opposite, it's a large number. <laughs> We're far when the, the by length of our axis is small number. Uh, anyway, we're um, starting from 10, 10 the by length, that's far from the plasma, and moving up to one the by length, which may be where things start uh, being problematic. And that's what I'm going to show. I'm showing here in the next plot that starts from uh, the by the Debye length and goes to one third of the Debye length. And you see that now the two solutions are clearly different. The blue one is the um, <clears throat> numerical solution of the exact equation. The orange one is the approximate solution 
that we got from um, uh, Taylor expanding uh, that term in, uh, in our equation. Okay, uh, so now we have hopefully uh, a better feeling of uh, the meaning of uh, this length. And in fact, there is, there is a couple of things that are going to come out of um, uh, the, the by length. One is that, okay, we said far from the um, best charge that we put into the system, um, the system, the electric potential can be described um, by <clears throat> assuming can be correctly described, assuming that uh, it's going to be small, remember small as compared to the uh, kinetic energy of, of the plasma. But if you think of what, what is going on, that's only going to work if I have enough particles in uh, that are close enough to my test particle. I'm um, making electrons move by inserting a, a test particle could be positive or negative. If I don't have enough electrons to move around and uh, shield that particle and make my electric potential go down uh, farther than a <clears throat> at a distance farther than at the by length, then um, all my argument breaks down. So that lets me conclude that in order for a plasma to be a plasma, it is necessary to have a sufficiently large number of particles in a volume that is determined by a divide length. I can define that with uh, as a sphere or um, a cube. It doesn't really matter. But that is a necessary condition for my plasma to be, um, for me to be allowed to define my system uh, as a plasma. And um, I'm going to come back to this in a moment. There is something more that comes out of the, uh, the by length. <clears throat> And that is that I can treat the plasma as a collective um, entity, <clears throat> a collective medium, only if uh, I'm looking at events that take place over distances that are larger or much larger than the Dubai length. <clears throat> Otherwise, the type of description that I've been using is not, not going to work and we just showed um, showed it in, uh, in that picture that you're still uh, seeing on the screen <clears throat> okay sorry about that that's great now let's uh, get uh, back to <clears throat> some notes. Okay, here it is. Here's my tablet back. <clears throat> and what um, I want to write now is the number of um, particles in um, the by, let's say, a Dubai sphere. Um, I'm going to call this n sub d, d again stands for um, the by, and the number is going to be given by the density of the particles, say n times the volume that I'm looking at. And assuming that I'm looking at a sphere, that volume is going to be just 4 over 3 times pi times lambda d cubed. 
And if you remember the expression for lambda d, which you have conveniently written just above um, this expression, you see that this number is proportional to the temperature to the three halves over the square root of the density, density of the one half. This one half comes from three halves in the denominator times n in the numerator. Uh, this quantity, oops, sorry about that. Should be a way to make this disappear. <laughs> this quantity, which I'm going to put in a nice little box now, actually has a, a specific name and it's called the plasma parameter. We'll come back to this quantity later in uh, the, our textbook. If you're following on the textbook, you'll see that this is actually introduced a uh, little later. Um, but I uh, prefer to introduce it at this stage when we talk about uh, the by length, because as you've seen, it follows naturally. To define some length, you may wonder okay, how many particles do I have in um, a volume that uh, is proportional to the length uh, to the third power. Well, <clears throat> you're going to have a number that's um, defined by this plasma parameter. And from what I uh, said, we need this plasma parameter to be large for my plasma to behave like a plasma. If you've been keeping track, this is the third property that we introduce in our definition of, um, of a plasma, the third property that needs to be satisfied by my system for, in order for it to be considered a plasma. <clears throat> One thing that I would like to uh, emphasize is that this, uh, all of these definitions actually are, as I said already in lecture one, a little fuzzy. What does much larger than one mean? Is it 10, 1000? That's going to depend at the end on, um, on the problem you're looking at uh, so there is no uh, fixed number and also the trans uh, all of these definitions do not define uh, hard limits it's not uh, like if the temperature is below you know zero celsius or 32 fahrenheit uh, water with fr will freeze at atmospheric pressure if it's above it will not and that's sort of the cutoff. This is not um, such a. Um, all of these are not such strict transitions. So you always have to look at them as um, guidelines. Okay, um, there is going to be a little more uh, to say on this, but let's now move on to our next topic and that's going to be plasma sheets make a separation here and let's get to talk about plasma sheets now, what is a plasma sheet is the first natural question. 
that we should ask. <clears throat> I'm not quite going to answer that question in that way. I'm going to start from uh, um, the situation in which um, plasma sheets arise and uh, um, that will allow us to give a good clear definition of what the plasma sheet is. So let me use this color and uh, <clears throat> let me make this messy thing here which is going to be some solid could be a wall a probe or something like that and on this side of uh, that solid object I'm going to have my plasma now what is going to happen my uh, particles ions and electrons are moving in uh, in the plasma and uh, as they're moving, they're going to hit the <clears throat> that solid wall. So both ions and electrons with different velocities. We'll uh, uh, we'll get to that in a moment. what's going to happen then when a charged particle hits my wall <clears throat> it typically can uh, stick to it and, uh, and get absorbed it this also depends on uh, again the details of the situation it may be that the plasma is at a very high temperature or the particle that's hitting the solid wall is at a very high temperature and it will dislocate some atom from the, the surface instead of being absorbed <clears throat> this can get very <clears throat> very um, complicated but for now let's just assume <clears throat> that the particles that uh, manage to hit the plasma get absorbed this is actually um, an important um, phenomenon that you should uh, keep in mind uh, you know, plasma is a very purified gas uh, at least the plasmas we're going to be dealing with when um, plasma gets into contact with um, a wall it typically can just get absorbed as um, water falling into a sponge um, this is uh, quite important uh, for phenomena other than uh, than sheets and um, this has become actually a, a point of active research and contention in uh, tokamak um, disruptions if you ever get to <clears throat> to work on those i don't know if it's still a point of contention but it was for a while anyway back to our system what is uh, happening is that ions and electrons are moving close to uh, moving towards the wall they're moving in all directions so there is going to be some that enter in contact with the wall <clears throat> and uh, uh, the probability the, the rate with which um, charged particles hit the surface um, is um, given by um, the expression let me call that rate little r 
it's one fourth of n times v. Mm -hmm. There is um, this, let me um, put that in writing, this per unit area. I'm not going to justify this expression that comes from um, uh, gas kinetic theory. If you've never seen it before, that's okay. Just take it as um, uh, as a given, where V is defined as a function of the temperature as eight times T divided by pi times m underscore root numerical factors are not important at this stage what is important is that this is proportional to square root of t over m and you'll notice that here i'm um, implying the boltzmann constant or if you prefer i change my units um, or um, that's actually what I'm going to be doing uh, for the rest of today. I'm going to ignore the, the Boltzmann constant. Okay, then um, that's the expression we, we have. And that's what we can uh, work with. And uh, you immediately notice that the dependence on the mass means that the velocities for ions and electrons in general will be different unless the temperatures are in a very specific ratio, which is um, far from unity. Um, the, this velocity for the electrons is going to be much larger than the velocity for the ions. But we just said that the rate uh, at which particles hit the wall is proportional to this velocity. Therefore, electrons are going to hit the, the wall much more frequently than ions. Let's say our ions are you know, protons. That ratio is going to be a factor of more than 40. If they're heavier, ions for instance just deuterium to get another square root of two in with that uh, with respect to that factor so you get up to 60 and for even heavier ions you do the math well then um the um And the solid that I have here is going to acquire a negative charge because on average, more electrons are going to hit it than uh, ions. Now let's see um, what this takes us to. What we're interested in is um, the steady state situation. So we understand we put in an object in the plasma electrons start hitting it more frequently than ions so that object acquires a negative charge what where are things going to uh, to end up is that uh, just a transient or is that the final state of the system okay now i'm going to make a, a simplifying assumption let me write down um, the fluxes of ions and electrons uh, at the wall. The ion flux is going to be one over four and I prime times VI. I'll uh, tell you what the prime means in a second. And the electron flux is going to be the same expression, 
with the subscript E instead of I. So this is going to be one fourth and E prime V sub E. This prime means uh, at um, the surface. Let me... That is the density at the surface uh, could be um, different from uh, the density at, away from the surface, the original density of the plasma. And uh, for simplicity, I'm going to assume this is approximately correct. It's not exact, but it's not uh, out there making no sense whatsoever. Um, but again, as a simplification, I'm going to assume that um, Ni prime is approximately equal to N infinity. And here, implicitly, I'm assuming that ions are singly charged. They are going to be protons or, or some other hydrogen isotope. And uh, uh, instead, I'm going to expect that the electron density will not be equal to the density at infinity. <clears throat> but it will include, again, a <clears throat> factor that depends <clears throat> on the electric potential uh, close to the, uh, to the wall. <clears throat> OK, now I can write um, the electrical current or rather the current density time assuming that the solid extends to infinity which just means it's big enough that i can ignore the the end effects i'm in some region of the plasma that's far enough from the ends of this wall that i don't have to worry uh, about what what happens there Then my current density, I'm not going to use vector symbols for the current uh, density, but this is going to be uh, given by um, charge of the ions times ion flux, which is one fourth Ni prime V sub I. This, um, well, now I'm just going to we indicate with <clears throat> a bar to emphasize that it's not that that is, that is the average velocity that I introduced here. These are. Let me remind you. Some properly defined averages. Again, they come from gas dynamics. I'm not going to worry about what they are. I mean, what? How did I get the, those numbers? Okay, that's the flux of the ions. This is the flux of the electrons times the charge of the electrons and E prime V sub E. And now I can replace the expressions I have on the line above. Um, for the ions, the charge is going to be E, which is the same charges for the electrons, except for the sign. So I'm going to, just collect terms e times n infinity and i have a factor of four for both i'm just going to divide by four let's see what i have left for the ions i have vi average and for the electrons i have v electrons times this exponential so e to the um, 
if I S S stands for sheet over T times V electrons. We're almost there. <clears throat> now at steady state, there is not going to be any charge um, accumulate any further charge accumulating to uh, onto the surface. That is, the net current must be zero. Well, then all I have to do is set to zero the quantity that I have between uh, those two brackets, and the, the square brackets. And uh, that's pretty simple. What I obtain is that V I bar over V E bar must be equal to E to the E phi sub S over T. Take the log um, and solve for phi S. So phi S is going to be equal to um, T. Let me emphasize that this is the temperature of the electrons just in case. I hope that was uh, obvious enough, but let's just be safe. Okay, T sub E divided by E times the log of um, VI over VE. Now remember those definitions. This gives me T sub E over E. Um, I have square roots, so I'm going to take out a factor of one half from the log. And um, set the log of T sub i times M e divided by T sub e times M ions. Okay, that's going to be my expression for this potential. And this is what I'm going to call the sheath potential. Um, let's see. Let me find a different color here. Going back to my picture up here, that potential is going to be, um, significant only close to my surface and the region where uh, that is the case is the region I'm going to call the sheet. Now to, um, you can easily put this into any um, software, mathematical language or your phone to get some numbers, but just to get an idea, the um, if, um, let's see, I assume, um, oops, sorry, I need to go back to blue, that the of the electrons and T of the ions are the same, um, then my sheath potential is going to be T E over E um, times one half of the log of M E over M I.
then this is going to be equal to minus 3.75 roughly. Wow, that was a five. Um, e e over e for protons and just substitute the mass of the the ratio between mass of the protons and the end of the electrons in um, that expression and you know, take the log and you get about four t over e And uh, you see that um, you know, once you're, you have made uh, or taken all of these assumptions that the temperatures are the same, and you know, they don't need to be exactly the same. You're taking a log. So uh, the temperature are approximately the same. That ratio is about one and the log is about zero. You don't have to worry too terribly much. Then what you uh, get is that this potential is just going to depend on the temperature of the electrons. Now, if um, you've been um, uh, listening carefully or paying full attention, or if you are seeing this for the 50th time, trying to figure out what on earth am I talking about, you um, may have noticed that um, this value that I've calculated is um, not actually a function of space. I'm not assuming that the temperature of the electrons changes with space. So that's just a number. Uh, so what is uh, what is going what 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 did I actually calculate? That is going to be the potential uh, at um, on the wall uh, on my solid surface. Then um, I should figure out what the behavior of the potential is as a function of space. How does it vary from this value to whatever value I should have at infinity? Uh, that's more complication than I want to, to get into, but I can give you a very kind wavy um, Estimate for the thickness of, of the sheet. I'm going to write sheet thickness here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume um, that things in my sheet vary um, <clears throat> on scales that are of the order of the, um, the by length. If I do that, then I can estimate <clears throat> the gradient of uh, my potential <clears throat> as I know there's a lot of suspense suspense here i s over lambda d <clears throat> which um, which is actually <clears throat> uh, 
or um, good qualitative uh, estimate, but it's missing something. What is what it's missing is that we're now looking at um, the um, scale length over which we can't assume that my exponential in um, the distribution function, the piece that you still, still see up there, e times phi divided by t, that's not small anymore. Then <clears throat> in, uh, in magnitude. Then I can um, go back outside to where that um, assumption was valid and try to estimate the gradient from, from there. And uh, correct my estimate. as uh, an absolute value <clears throat> t over e times one over lambda d and uh, assume that that gradient will be some sort of average or representative gradient over the the size of the sheet and it needs to be um, maintained for a large enough distance to get to the value of the potential that we um, obtained before, which is the one I have up here still. Then by putting those two together, and this is going to be really hard math, but I can. Uh, define x sub s the thickness of the sheet to be of the order of four lambda d for the by lengths. Again, this is not rigorous. I hope I'm um, conveying that, but it's uh, not an unreasonable estimate. It's, it's a pretty decent estimate, actually, at least for order of, um, of magnitude. All right, then we have um, gone into a little bit more detail on uh, plasma sheets than uh, our textbook does. But um, We have not really deviated from uh, our our plan to follow our textbook. I know that in, um, in some fields, some subfields of plasma physics, this may be uh, quite important. And so I thought it was worth to spend a little bit more time uh, on them. Okay, now to summarize the situation where I insert a, a solid uh, that could be a wall into my plasma is that the solid or wall will uh, acquire a negative charge and uh, the plasma since it was originally quasi neutral will acquire a positive charge and uh, we um, figured that out just by observing that electrons are moving faster than ions and um, there is going to be um, measurable electric uh, potential close to the surface and that's going to be called the, the sheet potential in the region where the sheet potential is um, important, non-negligible, is or the order of a few Debye lengths. And that is going to be 
Uh, what we're going to say about um, um, plasma sheets. And we're now going, going to move on to our next topic. Separation here. And our next topic is going to be, as in our book, what is called the plasma frequency. Now, um, other textbooks will uh, actually not introduce this quantity at this point because uh, it can reasonably be argued that it belongs more uh, to the section of um, uh, our book or our course where we talk about waves. But on the other hand, it's um, uh, sort of a fundamental property of the plasma. So it does fit in here. And it's not going to cost all that much work. So might as well do it. Now, I'm going to do a, a very simple sketch. But if you want to see that same sketch done uh, a lot better, refer to our textbook and go look at figure number 2.3. But let me try to reproduce that. Wish me luck. OK, let me, uh, let's see. Just deciding which color to use. I should have decided back end of time. But let's um, start with blue. And uh, let's say we have a plasma that looks like this, where top and bottom will extend to infinity, or if you prefer, we're just neglecting them, neglecting their effect. Now, this is my um, quasi neutral plasma. So I have uh, the same number of ions and electrons, and I'm assuming that ions are singly charged. If not, I have the same uh, number of positive and negative charges with whatever number of particles I need uh, to make that happen. Then what I'm going to do is take my electrons and move them Okay, I have moved my electrons in uh, red by some amount. Let me write it in uh, in red again, delta x. Okay, now it's uh, pretty obvious what's uh, happening. I'm going to have positive charges on this side because I displaced the electrons and I'm going to have negative charges on this side for the same reason, because I moved the electrons to a region where there are no ions. And uh, that's going to give me, uh, there are, there is no um, net charge in um, the, um, the intermediate region. But since I have positive charges on the left and negative charges on the right, I'm going to end up with an electric field, which I'm going to draw in blue and not red. So let me do that again. Sorry about that. Uh, 
Okay, that's my electric field. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time doing this calculation. You can easily figure out what that um, uh, what that electric field is. Simple um, E and M calculation. That field is going to be n zero e times delta x over epsilon naught. Then um, I'm going to take my system and uh, just let the electrons go. I have no idea how I was keeping the electrons, holding the electrons there before, but somehow I was managing and now I just let them go. And what am I going to have is um, um, the equation of motion for uh, the electrons that are going to be um, subject to um, force due to the electric field that I can uh, um, express as mass times acceleration. Now I'm going to say, well, let me say that delta X is going to change. That's what's going to um, determine the position of my electrons is the size of delta X. That's was some delta X zero at the beginning. Now it's uh, going to be delta X of time. Okay, then I take the derivative of delta X with respect to time twice and I get the acceleration. And that's going to be equal to my force. It's going to be a restoring force. And substituting the expression of uh, the uh, electric field. So I have N zero, I have E square, delta x over epsilon uh, epsilon zero and um, uh, and that's pretty much it that's going to be a pretty difficult equation okay let's see uh, right i left myself the space to put the minus sign i didn't put it there okay that, now it looks better it's a restoring force what does this thing look like? Let's uh, write it in a different way. Second derivative of delta x with respect to time is equal to minus n zero e square over m e times epsilon zero times delta x. That's a simpler harmonic oscillator equation. That's pretty uh, trivial. You know how to solve it, and you know that the solution is going to be an oscillatory solution with frequency. Let me just write it square equal to N zero e squared divided by epsilon naught times m e. And this quantity takes the name of plasma frequency. Now, what have we done? Uh, again, we're um, only moving the electrons one more time. <laughs> the poor ions never get to go anywhere. What's uh, happening here is 
one more time, we're doing the calculation in the simplest possible way, assuming that only one type of particle is moving. But in general, ions could move too, and you may have more than one species of ions. Um, I'm going to leave that as a, as a homework. But you notice the subscript E in my expression for the plasma frequency, because that's going to be the electron plasma frequency. And you will also notice that everything that's in there is a constant of nature, the electron charge, the mass of the electron, epsilon zero, the only uh, variable you really have in there is the electron density. So it is our conclusion that the um, frequency of these oscillations will just be proportional to the square root of the density with the constant of proportionality being actually a constant. It's, mm, it's going to be the same for any plasma. I'm also going to point out something else here. Um, let's see. No. Uh, yeah, it's, sorry. sorry about that. If I can uh, put a box around this, yeah, that's good enough. You will notice here that um, I have the electron mass in uh, the denominator. So you can imagine if um, you have a different type of charge, if you have ions, they're kind of going to move in the same way and the mass is going to go in the denominator. Okay, so what, what am I saying? That in the same way, I can expect to find um, um, frequency omega plasma ions that's going to be of this type, assuming that the, the ions are singly charged as usual. I'm going to have n times charge square times uh, divided by epsilon zero times the mass of the ions. And since the mass of the ions is much larger than the mass of the electrons, this is going to be much less than the plasma frequency of the electrons. So that's really the, um, the point. The frequency, you'll see in a homework how to um, calculate, what well, hopefully you'll see, it, how to calculate um, um, a more general expression of the plasma frequency in which you allow both ions and electrons to move. But you'll see that the result is that the plasma frequency that you obtain is essentially the electron plasma, fre plasma frequency. Okay, that was that <clears throat> for the plasma frequency. Now there is um, quite a bit more in. Uh, uh, in this chapter in our textbook. But for today, we're only going to look at um, one more thing. Okay, the last thing we're going to look at is uh, the cyclotron frequency. So let me write that down. This is not going to be very complicated. If you thought the plasma frequency was simple, this one is going to beat it. Um, well, also because you're already familiar with it, really. What, um, what this is, is the generation frequency of a charged particle around a magnetic field line. Now, the 
reason why um, it's worth stopping here for a moment and um, introducing introducing this too uh, is that this is the first piece of um, all of what we're doing where the magnetic field actually shows up and that the by length doesn't depend on the magnetic field um, the plasma frequency does not depend on the magnetic field sheets you can have regardless of magnetic field Just remember there is no dependence on the magnetic field in our equations for the plasma sheet and the uh, first place where we actually have the, the magnitude of the magnetic field actually matters is in this cyclotron frequency and uh, I'm not going to do any derivation you know this from uh, uh, elementary physics I'm just going to introduce the symbol omega cyclotron is going to be equal to charge of the particle times b divided by m where my um, uh, particle can be positively or negatively charged that's why I'm taking the absolute value however uh, it is um, on occasions useful to keep the sign of the charge in the definition to uh, emphasize the fact that ions and, the, and, the, and electrons are going to gyrate in, uh, in opposite directions. And um, this motion perhaps belongs um, to um, the, the next chapter, the one where we look at motion of a single particle motion. In some textbooks, that's where you'll find it. Uh, but again, it's sort of a fundamental property of a magnetized plasma to have uh, this generation motion. That's why it um, sort of fits in here. Um, and since it's going to be a, a little bit longer before we make it to generation when the single particle motion actually it's not a bad idea to uh, to put it uh, <clears throat> in our list of um, of plasma properties at this point okay i uh, think this is a good place to stop and we'll um, pick up from here. Um, there is still going to be quite a bit of time that we need to spend on uh, the introduction. We're going to talk some more about collisions, uh, some more about the plasma parameter, and uh, some uh, deeper mathematical things. Okay, then that is all for today and I will see you next time.